Uh, so the title of my sermon this morning is The Purpose of Praise. The Purpose of Praise. I want to touch on this topic again. I haven't talked about singing in a while. I want to encourage you guys and, and talk about how important music is in the Christian life and uh, you know, the, the effect that it has and that you know, Christians should be singing. You know, it's something that it's part of the Christian life is praising God. You know, some people, you know, didn't grow up singing. They're not really strong singers themselves. But it's something, as a Christian, you should grow into. You should desire to want to get better at singing. It shouldn't be something where you're just like, oh, that's just not something I do. You know, that's not how you live the Christian life. You know, it's like reading. You know, like maybe you're somebody that, you know, in the, in the culture we grow up in, just always watching videos all the time. And you say, well, I don't read. Well, that's too bad. You know, as a Christian, you've got to read. You know, it's something you have to do. You can't just say, I'm not a reading person. And it's the same with singing. You can't just say, I don't like singing. I'm not really a singing person. That is something you need to grow into because God wants you to do it. So we see here in Colossians 3.16, uh, which is why we read Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we're going to see three things in this passage that we'll talk about this morning. But just by way of introduction, you need to realize that music is a very powerful tool. And it's an extremely powerful tool. And, you know, sometimes people underestimate the power of music, but then you have to think about, even in your own life, you can experience it. I mean, so many of us remember, you know, jingles of advertisements um, when we were little. You know, sometimes when a song comes on, you don't, you don't know um, like who composed that song or what that song is called, some classic song, but you remember the ad jingle, right? And you remember the different word jingles. And I'm sure some of you could maybe thinking of some right now where you grew up. And that, that's the impact of like, you know, advertising and songs and putting things to songs. You know, that helps you to remember things, helps you to, uh, you know, remind you of things and it creates emotion. That's the power of music. But then when you put music to words, then the words stick with you. And you find yourself humming them to yourself. You know, we all, all, we've all had that experience where, you know, a song is stuck in your head. You know, we listen to, you know, those of us who are parents, and you know, our children have those children's toys and the music plays and plays, and then you're at work and you realize you're singing the songs because you're hearing them all the time. Well. You want to harness that sort of that power with, with God's songs. You know, you can use that so that God's word and God's music and spiritual songs, like psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, are on the tip of your tongue, are the ones that you find humming to yourself, are the ones that you can't get out of your head. That is a good thing. So music is a powerful tool, but it can go both ways, right? It's like a double-edged sword that can cut... And it can, do, it can do good or it can do bad, depending on how it's used. So music can enhance the impact of spiritual words. It can help you be reminded of spiritual truths. You know, music can affect your spirit. You know, and therefore, it can affect your attitude. Um, you know, music can change your emotional state. You know, this is why you know, movies and shows and clips and things, they, they use different music to invoke different emotions so it can, it can impact your emotional state and when they talk about you know places you know in marketing they talk about the vibe of a place what's the vibe you want for your video or something this is how it makes you feel right so music can impact these things and like I said at the beginning singing is a major part of the Christian life think about the largest book in the Bible the largest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms it's a song book right so Think about how important that is to God, singing and music, that the largest book in the Bible is a book of songs. It's a hymn book, right? And this book of Psalms, you know, we tend not to, re like not to really think about that Psalms is a book of music and a book of singing because we quote Psalms, a lot of prophecies from Psalms, teaching and doctrine and history and you know, exhortation, right? But... Remember, this is, a, this is a music book. It's a song book. So you can see how God uses song. He uses music to, like, you know, to reinforce things. And this is one thing I think about when I think about the memory verses is if I can find tunes for the songs, then those memory verses will stick 
with the children. And you know, maybe some of you have heard Noah singing, you know, Thy word have I hid in my heart. That's our, you know, uh, our memory theme verse for Kids Bible Club. You know, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So it just helps them to remember these verses. Right? So we want to harness that power for good rather than for bad. Now, Psalm 22.3 tells us here, But thou art holy, talking about the Lord, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Right? So God inhabits the singing of his people. And you know, this sort of ties in with the fact that God is a spirit and you have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the word of God. They're singing from the book of Psalms. So it's a very interesting concept here that you know, God inhabiting the praises of Israel when they sing God's word. But it makes you think who is inhabiting or who dwells in the ungodly praises of the world? You know, when you sing worldly music. So music is used by Satan and the world to influence you and your family as well. So we need to take care of that. Satan is a musical being. In Ezekiel 28, 11, we see here uh, a pro prophetical words about the king of Tyrus, but it is used to describe Satan. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. So why is it a lamentation? Because it's talking about the judgment that's going to happen on the king of Tyrus. But this is also prophetically talking about the judgment that will come upon Satan. <clears throat> and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So you think he's talking about King of Tyrus, right? But these are actually things talking about Satan. He's wise. He's beautiful. So you see how Satan, Satan understands these things. That's why he's so effective in, in you know, his, his worldly propaganda, right? And all the things that he does in the world. Because he knows wisdom. So he understands marketing, he understands beauty, but he also understands music. How do we know he's talking about Satan? Because look, King of Tyrus was not in Eden. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. So he understands, he has riches. The workmanship of thy tabrets. See, tabrets is a musical instrument. And of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So you see how Satan is a musical creature. He understands music. And this is why, you know, that you hear stories, and I'm sure some of them are true, where, you know, musicians and artists have possibly made deals, satanic deals with the devil. And they have like an unnatural ability to sing and an unnatural ability to play music. You know, and, and maybe it is to me. We just see it as talent. But maybe it was given to them supernaturally through demonic means. Um, because Satan, you know, obviously can, can grant certain things like this. You know, he was able to offer to Jesus Christ in all the kingdoms of the world and things like that. So they have supernatural powers. And who knows if they're able to grant special abilities to different people. But we can see here, he's a musical creature. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So very good, insightful information there about Satan. You can learn a lot about Satan in the Bible, uh, but this sermon is not about Satan. But what I wanted to mention, and why I'm talking about it this morning, is, you know, music will be used by the world and by Satan to influence you and your family. You want to minimize the influence that that has on you and make sure you have positive influence, right? That's why you want to, you know, have God's music, right? And God's word in your life rather than just the music of the world. So, you know, you should change your playlist. You know, if you, you know, we are creatures of habit. This is why habit is a very powerful force. And you grow up with a certain style of music and you grow up with certain songs that you tend to gravitate towards. You need to make, like, purpose it in your heart to actually make that change, to change those things, change your playlist. You know, start to listen to different types of music, different types of lyrics, so that that is in your life rather than just the worldly music that you grew up with, right? Get rid of the worldliness. 2 Corinthians 7 
Uh, verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Right? So it's not just about being clean in body, but you want to be clean in spirit as well. Remember, what is spirit? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So it's the words that you're feeding yourself. You're feeding yourself with words of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the filthiness that you want to cleanse yourself of rather, you know, and, and fill yourself with good things. Right? Luke 6, 45, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So you see what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. You know, what are you filling your heart with? Are you filling your heart with good treasure or are you filling your heart with evil treasure? The more, the more you fill your heart with evil treasure, the more it comes out. Right? Because that's what's in your heart. So change the playlist. Replace bad music. Replace it with good music. Replace it with hymns. Replace it with audio Bible, sermons, podcasts, instrumentals. You know, try and break those bad habits. You know, there's a lot of different bad habits in the world, but we're talking about music right now. And one of the bad habits is, you know, you just listen to the music you grow up with. You just keep listening to it. And then, you know, that's going to go on to the next generation as well, which is unfortunate, right? So change the playlist. So this morning we want to talk about the purpose of praise purpose of singing. we got the parallel passages in Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I don't think there's a difference between, um, too, much, or too much of a difference between psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. I just think it's three ways to say the same thing. I just think it's reinforcing it. But we see here as well in Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So you can see the different chapters touching on two different, uh, on the same sort of topics here. So we'll talk about three different things we see in this passage that offer the purpose of praising. So the first one is the, one of the purposes of music and singing in the Christian life is it's meant to teach and admonish. It's meant to teach and admonish. What does it mean to admonish? Right? Admonish means it corrects you, tells you off, right? and makes you sort of puts you in the right direction. And obviously teaching is like, so you're learning new things, or you know, may not be learning new things, but being reminded of new things, or reminded of the same things. You know, sometimes we forget things, or we sing songs, we're reminded of them. You know, that's what advertisers want you to do. You forget about their product, but if you know their jingle, you're going to be reminded of their product, reminded of their product. You won't forget. Well, it's the same thing about God's truth. We don't necessarily want to forget these things. And when we sing about them, we are reminded of them. Right? So the question is always asked in Christian circles, you know, what makes music right or wrong? And people argue over different things. What is it? Is it the age of the song? Do all our songs just need to be old? Right? And then therefore they're right, and all the new ones, all the contemporary music is wrong. No, it's not the age of the song. It's not the type of instruments used. You know, different churches use different instruments. People use different instruments and different genres of music. Is it the type of instruments that are used that makes music right or wrong? No, because music is, 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 is neutral, isn't it? There's just different styles of music, whether it uses drums or doesn't use drums. It doesn't make music right or wrong. Some people think, like, you know, Christian music has to just be like with a piano, not with a too strong bass beat or anything, because otherwise that makes it wrong, it's too worldly. No, that's not, 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 that's not what makes music worldly, in my opinion. You, know, you can have good music that may have an upbeat or a strong bass line, and you have bad music that is upbeat, uses drums, and has a bass line. What about its effect on the emotions? People say like, oh, you know, the music of the world just try and sway his emotions. It doesn't, you know, really just you know, have good lyrics, but, you know, good songs, even spiritual songs will get you emotional if they are written well and they have good music that goes along with them. So the effect on the emotions is not in and of itself bad. Or what about the genre of music? People say the genre is good. So classical is like spiritual, but then you have like hip-hop is like bad. You know, and just because like the, you know, maybe the, 
the majority of a genre is bad, like a lot of hip-hop music is very worldly and things like that, it doesn't mean that genre in and of itself is bad. Right? So you see, you've got to separate what is bad about a song versus what is neutral. Um, what about association? Some people will say, oh, you know, they don't want to sing a song or, you know, that song is bad because of who composed it or who sings it. But, you know, a lot of the hymns that we sing are not necessarily written by saved people. <laughs> you know, some of them are written by Catholics. Some of them are written just by, you know, other different people. So I don't think it's necessarily who writes the song, uh, who, um, you know, who sings the song, right? Even if, if what they've written is there's nothing wrong with it. So what, what, what really matters in music? Well, you know, to me, one of the purposes of praise is to teach and admonish. And to me, that is really, for me, what I think, is the deciding factor of what makes a song good or bad, is what is it teaching you? What are the lyrics of the song? Because if you have just an intru instrumental, like if you have a song without any words, what does it do besides just create a vibe, create emotion? You'd only know if that song was upbeat, or minor scale, or slow or fast. But once you start adding words to the song, now it has an impact, right? Because now it's sharing a message. It's teaching something. It's reinforcing an idea. See, so the, so the, the tune itself is sort of neutral until it gets added to something. And it gets added to words. And now the words have an impact. Because now the music is like we talked about in the beginning. It enhances those words. The danger now is what are the words that are being enhanced and are being uh, you know, repeated to you again and again as you sing that song to yourself to those words. That is what is dangerous. So doctrine in the music matters. You know, that's why we've got to think about what does the song say? What does it teach? You know, and it, you want songs to be right. Not, and not just be right in doctrine, but exhort you to do right as well. So we have songs, you know, when we sing, when we talk about Christian songs, what are these songs? These are songs that praise God. You think about to God be the glory. Songs that remind us of the cross. You know, last week we sung the old rugged cross. So, you know, we sing redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. You know, it's talking about the death of Christ and his blood. You know, what about songs about the resurrection? He arose. You know, songs about faith. You know, faith is the victory. Songs about his power. Just thinking of the song, Master of the Tempest is Raging, talking about Jesus calming the storm, showing that he's God. You know, what about songs of prayer? So it's not just songs about prayer, like sweet hour of prayer, but also songs that are a prayer. You know, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, where we're singing, but also singing to God and requesting something. You know, songs of, about living right. You know, I am resolved, we'll work till Jesus comes. Songs about going soul winning. You know, bring them in, are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? So, because songs should teach and admonish, you know, the doctrine of a song is important. So there's three examples I like to give when I talk about singing, where there are sometimes errors in songs. You know, here's a, we're coming up on Christmas soon. You know, a lot of people sing this song, We Three Kings, We Three Kings of Orion are, bearing gifts we travel afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. But this is actually, you know, this, these, these sorts of songs that people sing at Christmas, they make people think that the three people that went to visit Jesus, that there were three. We don't know how many there were. And it also makes them think that they were kings. Now, this is a minor error, but you can see how songs that put these things in just reinforce these incorrect ideas, right? Because what does the Bible actually say? Matthew 2, 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So wise men were not necessarily kings. If you remember, Daniel was a wise man. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, he called all the wise men and Daniel, you know, came as well. So wise men were just, you know, wise men. And they may be men of authority, but they weren't necessarily kings. So these wise men come, we don't know how many there were, but the reason why they always say three is because there was three gifts, but then you know, it could have been multiple, it could have been only two. So we don't know how many, but 
when we sing a song like this. So, you know, you can change the lyrics to songs. You know, people change lyrics to songs all the time. I mean, you can see the, the Pentecostal church changes songs, lyrics to songs, because they, they believe, they don't believe a lot of things that, um, you know, sometimes mainstream Christianity believes. But, you know, people will change words to songs. But I don't know if this one will, will go that well. We wise men of Orientar, but... You know, I've got some other examples where it might work better. So my Saviour's love is another example. For me, it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs. The original words of this song is, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Now, I don't know how many of you have this idea that when Jesus was in the garden, that he actually sweat blood. But some people believe that. I don't know if this song is partly to blame, where they taught that when Jesus was in the garden, he was sweating so profusely that he actually sweat drops of blood. And this is what this song is saying. But this is not actually the case. Right? Luke 22 says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So it's actually using the analogy of blood to describe the, the amount of sweat that he was sweating. You know? great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's what his sweat was like, but he was not actually sweating blood in the garden. So this is why when we sing this song in church, I actually changed um, these, these lyrics so that, you know, when our children grow up and they think of this song, they're not saying, saying but sweat drops of blood from, from uh, our mind. Um, I changed it to, but went to the cross for mine. For me, it wasn't the garden he prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but went to the cross for mine. All right, so I, change, I actually changed that, so you don't even know, see? You know, this is some fake news, you know? So they give you a song, you didn't even know it was manipulated. <laughs> give, you the, give you some truth, so some true, true news, not fake news. So sometimes songs have some really grave errors. So this is a song that, that a lot of people in Fundamental Baptist churches grow up singing. Victory in Jesus, a very catchy tune. I heard an old, old story, how a saviour came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. So there in this song is a blatant call to work salvation. Right? He repented of his sins, his work salvation, and then got saved. Right? So you can see that this song, if it's sung over and over again, it's just reinforcing this false doctrine. You know, because this phrase in the Bible is never used. You know, I repented of my sins. The Bible uses the term repentance, right, which is a very different concept when it comes to salvation. It's repenting from dead works, the faith toward God. So, you know, we can change the lyrics to songs like these, so it teaches right doctrine, you know. So I remember when I used to sing this song, I would say, and then I trusted only him and won the victory. So you can still sing these so songs. You don't have to totally discard them, but we just change them to teach the right things rather than the wrong things. Right? Sometimes songs have minor errors, sometimes songs have major errors. But see, when you sing the song, you, know, you need to consider the words when you sing a song. You know, it's similar to reading your Bible. You know, sometimes like, you'll sit down, you know, sometimes when you read your Bible and then you realize you're just looking at the words and you're not really thinking about what those words say. Well, that's what can happen with music. You, know, you can be singing hymns, but do you actually consider what the hymns say? what the hymns are actually teaching you. And you should when you sing songs, and especially when you sing to God. So, first one is songs teach and admonish. So, what are the songs you listen to teaching and admonishing you of? You know, there's a lot of music in this world that is teaching the wrong things. So, we need to change our playlist, get those songs out of our lives, you know, and, and have songs that do not teach wrong things. They don't necessarily need to teach spiritual things. You know, sometimes you can just teach just things that are decent in the world without teaching things that are indecent in the world. Alright, so number two is one another. Right? So we see here in Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 teaching and admonishing one another. Right? In Ephesians it says speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is why we sing congregationally. So part of singing in the Christian life and part of you know, the purpose of singing is to sing to other people. 
right? Sing to other people, sing to yourself as well. So we talked about like what do the words teach? When you sing it to yourself, you're reinforcing those words. But part of the Christian life is to sing to others too. And this is why we come together as a church and we sing together, right? We're singing to one another. We are speaking to yourselves, speaking to ourselves. Hebrews 2.12, look, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So you want to sing both to yourself and to others. You know, you want to make sure you come to church early enough to be part of the singing. You know, don't, don't treat the first part of church like that's not church. Like church is not only the preaching. You know, like if you come just in time for the preaching and say, I made it for church. Like you didn't make it for church. Like you, you were late to church. You know, you missed the first part of church, which is also important. You know, we try and include prayer and praise because these are things that are part of the Christian life that we want to do together as a church too. So you know, make sure you come early enough to be part of the singing. See, and when you sing, because you want to teach and admonish one another, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, you should be sung to be heard by others. So you can edify one another. Right? It's not about glorifying yourself. It's about being heard so you can encourage other people to sing. Other people are encouraged to sing. So when you come to church, you know, and we praise God, hey, everyone should be singing. You know, everyone should be singing to the Lord. You know, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Look, will I sing praise unto thee? You see, you, you want to sing praise in the midst of the church. You know, but sometimes when I look out and leading the songs, people are just head down. People just staring forward. Just like nothing. You know, they're singing in their mind. But you need to sing to be heard. Everyone should be singing. Right? You know, God forbid you're like on your phone. Like sometimes people sometimes people get this idea that, like, you know, when we sing songs, that's the time to do something else. Check your phone, use the toilet, go get a drink, you know, do these things. No. When it, when the music, when we when it's time to sing, we, we are giving an opportunity for everyone to sing together. You should be singing to the Lord. Everyone should be singing. So this is why church songs are, you know, they need to be like predictable, simple rhythms so that people can sing together. You know, some of these contemporary songs, the problem is not that they're contemporary. The problem is that generally the beat is a bit more complex. It's harder for people to sing together. This is why you'll find that congregational songs tend to have a more simple traditional beat so that people can sing together. I mean, obviously you're not going to do a rap song as a congregational song, right? Try and you know, sing rap music together, right? So learn the songs. You know, if you don't know them, yeah, you can listen to them online as well. But you don't want to just come to church every week use the same excuse every week, well, I just don't know that song, I don't know that song. We don't sing that many different songs. And we sing the same songs so that people can remember these songs and learn these songs. But, you know, if you find yourself coming week after week after week saying, I don't know this song, either you don't at church often enough, <laughs> which is not a good thing, right? Or maybe you're just not making the effort to try and sing the song, learn the song. Or maybe in your personal life, you're listening to so much trash music that it's just like blocking out all the good music in your life. So, you know, if you change the music in your life, maybe you will know more hymns, you'll know more Christian music, and then you can sing them with your children. Right? So, that's one of the purposes, right? To come sing them. Look in 1 Corinthians 14. This is the church here. How is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edify. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. Right, so you can see singing is there in the local church. Now, just a, just a point that I usually talk about on special music, special idols. This is where, where you're in a church 
and somebody will get up and sing a song to the congregation. So we're not talking about a congregational song where everyone is singing. We're talking about a song where somebody comes up and they are singing to the congregation. And what I believe, and, and based on this passage and other passages as well, is that singing is part of the teaching ministry. So like we read further here in 1 Corinthians 14, it says here, and the spirits and the prophets are subject to the prophets. So that's a verse I usually talk about when you know, I talk about with Pentecostals where they, you know, they believe that when the Holy Spirit overcomes them, they just lose control. But the Bible says here, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Like people are always in control when they are preaching the word of God, right? And they are filled with the spirit. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. So this is talking about teaching the church, addressing the whole body of church, like I am right now. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the Lord. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So this is talking about addressing the whole congregation. So you can see here that when these people came together, they had a psalm, had a doctrine, had a tongue, had a revelation, had an interpretation. So they are sharing things that they learn. And sometimes things they learn are songs that they learn, songs that they're teaching or sharing with the church. And when you sing to the congregation, that is like teaching the church. So this is something that women should not do, right, when it comes to specials and things like that, you know, when they address the congregation. Um, so we see here as well in First Chronicles 25, where in the Old Testament, the Old Testament singers are teaching with music. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, and with cymbals, and the number of the workmen according to their service was. Of the sons of Asaph, Zachar, and Joseph, and Nethaniah, and As uh, Asar Asarela, the sons of Asaph, under the hands of Asaph, which prophesied according to the order of the king. Of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun, Gedaliah, Zeri, Jeshiah, Habashiah, Mattathiah, six, under the hands of their father Jeduthun, who prophesied with harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. So I think, you know, you know things like ministries where you're singing to the church should be led by men, should be done by men. You know, I think it's all right if it's like a choir, got women in it, but I think men should be leading those things because it's really a teaching ministry, especially when you're teaching the church. So just a, just a point about singing to one another. Right, singing to one another. So when you sing to one another, you want to make sure that you're singing to your children as well. You know, sing with your children to teach them biblical truths. And, you know, not all of you grew up in, you know, fundamental Christian homes. I didn't grow up in a fundamental Christian home either. Right? So you may think that, you know, singing hymns, singing with your family, you know, singing songs, is awkward. Well, anything you do the first time is awkward, right? You know, if you're not in the habit of praying with your family, it's going to be awkward at first. But, you know, that's why you have to overcome that awkwardness and just implement some things in your family so that you are praying together and it becomes a practice that is more normal. So, yes, Christian practices feel awkward at first if you didn't grow up with them. But, you know, if you're, you're more likely to sing hymns together as a family, if that's the sort of music you normally listen to. See, I didn't grow up in a Christian home either. You say, Victor, you know, it's, it's easy for you to say, Victor, you're, you're a bishop. Well, I wasn't always a bishop. You know that? I wasn't always a bishop. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up praying together, saying grace together, singing hymns together, you know, that sort of thing. But you know, when I got saved and I decided, you know what, I want to live a life that's pleasing to God, I made a point in my life to say, hey, you know, in my family, I want my children to have that sort of Christian upbringing. I'm not just going to play the music that I used to listen to in my house and you know, I want to kick back and listen to some music, so I listen to the music that I grew up with. And then that's the music my kids are going to grow up with. No, we changed the playlist, right? I made sure I had Christian music. Uh, I was given uh, by a lady when I was going to um, the church in Phoenix. 
just a, um, a whole list of piano songs, you know, piano hymns. And, you know, we used to, you know, we put our kids to sleep with music and try and calm them with music, and that's always the music that we use. So, you know, my kids have sort of grown up just listening to that sort of music, and that's what they identify as Christian music, and that's like a good habit that we're trying to teach them. I'm not saying that's the only music they need to listen to, but the Bible says, you know, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he was not depart from it. And, you know, I see that in my kids as, as they get older, that that's the sort of music they like to listen to. You know, when they, when they choose music to go to sleep with, you know, they choose different hymns that they like, you know. And they listen to sometimes the world's music, and it's like, oh, they, don't, they don't really jive with it because that's not what they grew up with. So you need to think about, you know, parents. You know, th this is your chance to create a Christian culture in your home. And you say, I didn't grow up with that Christian culture. Well, here's your chance to make sure your children grow up with that Christian culture. That they grew up with prayer. That they grew up with Christian songs. That they grew up going into church. You know, so that you can create that sort of environment for them. Singing together, praying together, giving thanks before a meal, reading the Bible together. What about the way they dress? You know, modest clothing. That's going to help as well. You know, clothing is one of those things where you just get comfortable wearing that. And it's another one of those awkward things, isn't it? Like if you're not used to just wearing modest clothing, that's awkward for somebody who's just used to wearing tight stuff all the time, used to wearing, you know, uh, you know things that expose them all the time. But here's your opportunity as a parent to raise children that don't dress like that. You know, that they get comfortable in more modest clothing. You know, what about swearing and other good habits? You know, other bad habits. Right? You can, this is your chance to raise them with good habits. That they don't swear. That they don't talk trash. That they, that they dress well. That they speak respectfully. All these sorts of things. So think about that when we sing one to another. All right? So... And the last point on singing here in this section is, you know, singing, you know, a lot of people sing in churches and they have choirs and they have singing ministry and things like that. And I'm not against these things. But singing is not a replacement for soul winning. <laughs> you know, no ministry in church is a replacement for soul winning, right? Sometimes people get so busy with ministries in church, like busy organising this, doing that, doing this, doing that, charity drive, doing this thing, that they don't go soul winning anymore. And I just want to make the point that no ministry replaces sewing. And the worst thing you can have in a church is like 50 people getting up in a choir, singing about how they want to reach the lost, and then you go to the soul winning hour and none of them are there. Right? So, you know, if we're going to sing, we want, to, we want singing to encourage us to actually do what we're singing about. And you see that in churches all the time. So, you know, soul winning is something that we all have to do. We have to be preaching the gospel. And we want to have ministries in our life as well, but one does not replace the other. All right, last point. Purpose of music, purpose of singing, is that we sing to the Lord. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's so many psalms that talk about praising the Lord. Psalm 717, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 111, 1. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Psalm 135, verse 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. Psalm 146, 2. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praise unto my God while I have any being. So singing is a command. It's not just a gift. You don't only sing because you're talented at it, you sing because you're commanded to praise the Lord. Right? That's something we have to, that's what I'm saying in church, everyone should be singing. Singing is a big part of the Christian life. If you, if you are not a singing Christian, you're a sinning Christian. Right? Because so, singing is a commandment of God. So like I said in the beginning, you don't want to live your life just saying to yourself all the time, oh, I'm not the singing type. You know, it's like saying, well, what if you're not the reading type? You're not the praying type. You're not the social type. 
you're not the outgoing. Well, you know, you need to grow in these areas. If you want to impact the world, you want to reach people, you need to grow in these areas. You know, you say, oh, I'm not the disciplined type. You know, well, you have to become a bit more disciplined. You know, you need to grow in these areas. You know, everyone has their natural talents and abilities. But, you know, does that mean that then you just don't even bother trying to improve? So, you know, you want to be growing spiritually in your spiritual life. And what does it mean to grow spiritually? When you're growing, it means you know something that you didn't know before. You're doing something that you didn't do before. Right? That's how you know you're growing. If you're, you know, think you're growing, but you're the same as you were before, I mean, are you, are you really growing? So, when you sing to the Lord, you know, remember when you sing, you are singing to the Lord. You're singing for the Lord. So you need to put some effort into it. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Um, even in, in Colossians 3, I didn't put this um, verse in my, my, my presentation, but it says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And that's a great reminder that we should do that in our singing too. So, so when you sing, a couple of thoughts there. We want to do it all to the glory of God. So don't just sing and say, oh, I'm singing. But do you strive to improve at singing? You know, try and sing louder. Try and sing more in tune. You know, your voice is a tool, you know, and the more you use it, the better you get at using it. You know, you say you're not that good at singing. Well, if you sing more, you will get better. Trust me, right? I wasn't always good at singing either, you know, but then you just, you just try and force them. You sing, you sing louder, you sing louder, and then you just get you, and then you, you learn to use your voice better because you use it more often because you're singing more, okay? Practice makes permanent. You know, usually the saying is practice makes perfect. And I like, I heard this video once that they say, I don't, I don't like the phrase practice makes perfect because you never get perfect. But if you say to yourself, practice makes permanent, that's what's really good. Because the more you do something, the more permanent it becomes. And it's the same with singing. The more you do it, the more permanent it becomes. Hebrews 13, 15. Look at what the Bible says here. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So when we sing to God, we want to sing to God consciously. That's why I like to remind you guys when we sing hymns on Sunday morning that, that I get you to think that, that you realize God is here with us. You know, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So God is here with us and he's hearing us praise him. Do you sing in a way where you realize that? Where you realize that when you sing to God on a Sunday morning, you are singing praises to the Lord God in heaven. And one thing to take comfort in is God likes singing. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sacrifice. It's something, it's an offering to him. Right? It's a sacrifice of praise. And he wants us to do it continually. So don't just sing only at church. You know, it's something you should do in your daily life. So like I said, if, you know, whatever you listen to in your life, music. That's what you will find yourself humming and singing to yourself during the day. So this is why it's so important that you put, you know, you change your playlist and you have spiritual songs and you're singing this, you know, the songs of God with good spiritual truth because then that is the sort of things that you're going to be singing to yourself throughout the day. Like I said, those are the things you want that you can't get out of your head. Right? So in conclusion, okay, don't underestimate the power of music. Make sure you change your playlist if you've got a bad playlist. Make sure the songs you listen to and sing do not have ungodly lyrics. Make sure they don't have error. You know, make sure you're, you know, you're, they're enforcing good lyrics. Right? Number three is strive to improve at singing. Don't just say, oh, I'm not good at singing, therefore I'm not going to sing. Well, first of all, you're commanded to sing. And second of all, you know, say, you know what, I'm going to try and get better at singing. I'm going to make an effort to try and do better. Right? You're going to do things to the glory of God. Practice makes permanent. Stop making excuses and just try. Right? And you want to be a singing Christian. Don't be a sinning Christian. Everyone should be singing. All right? So let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for um, your word this morning. Thank you for giving us the gift of music. And uh, help us not to abuse this gift and use it in a way that does not bring you glory. So I pray, Lord, that you will you know, fill our hearts with your word and with your truths. And uh, Lord, we'll use music to reinforce, lift our spirits, edify us, and also teach our children the truths of God. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for um, making, giving us this thing in this world. We pray in your precious name. Amen.